بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما آمين برحمتك يا رحم راحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته For those of us uh, watching online I am having issues here with the sound so it may be very echoey today I apologize for that uh, For those of us here in the masjid there's a very important announcement that I want to make at the beginning, middle and the end uh, because it affects all of us and that is the time of Eid Salah, inshallah. Uh, the time of the Eid procession, I should say rather, will be at 7.15. Uh, so we'll start with the English and then we'll have the, the Salah and then we'll have the Arabic Khutbah. So obviously with the Eid processions, the, the Salah precedes the Khutbah, but the English doesn't come. So as opposed to having the English Nasiha at the end, which will cause us to end significantly later uh, than we'd like to because of the, the busyness of the day. So we are going to be starting with the Eid English talk, or Nasiha if you may, from 7.30. So ideally the Jama'ah should arrive well in advance. Uh, I would imagine 7 a.m. should be good so that uh, the Takbir and so forth can take place in Laita'ala. Pertaining to the time that we find ourselves in, it is uh, it is the best time of the year. It is Yawm al Jumu'ah. It is also coinciding with our eighth day of Dhul Hijjah. Uh, the Hujjaj uh, are experiencing their ninth day of Dhul Hijjah, and therefore they are on the plains of Arafah. And accordingly, this day or these couple of days are literally the best and most significant days in the lives of believers for the entire year, right? So that, that's pertaining to the days. What is so significant about the day of Arafah? Well, we already know that the Hujjaj stand and there's a special time, they call it Wukuf, and this time is the requirement for you to be on Arafah at that particular time, and even if you're there for a moment, it's actually mind-blowing, if you're there for a moment, you attain Hajj. If you're there, just being present, having the niyyah, you attain Hajj, right? Uh, somebody, somebody looked at some people wearing normal clothing on Arafah, because sometimes you go as a, as a volunteer or as an assistant with a group, and then uh, you wear normal clothing because they, they have this agreement with you that you're not supposed to perform Hajj. It's a bit of a weird arrangement. But nobody can actually stop you if you're on Arafah. Even if you don't have the Haram on, you can pay a dam for not wearing the clothing of the Haram, but you can still have the Hajj. Right? Uh, the point in me saying this is just to demonstrate how amazing Allah's Rahman is. Sometimes you see helicopters uh, well, I haven't personally seen it, but I've seen it on TV. So they fly with these helicopters over, and I'm told that patients who couldn't physically make their way to Arafah, they get flown over. And they just get flown over, that's it. But they get Arafah. Uh, this is the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His forgiveness. We've already spoken about the fact that it's the day that the verse was revealed. You've spoken about the fact that Sayyidina Umar said he knows that that verse was revealed at the time when it was in fact Eid. We've spoken about the forgiveness that the Hujjaj attained. This day, the day of Arafah, is also a day upon which Allah Ta'ala takes an oath in the Quran. In Surah Al Buruj, that Surah number 85, verse number 3, Allah says, wa wa mashhud. By the witnessing day, the Shahid which the Mufassirun explain refers to the Friday because we witness that day and then wa mashhud and the witnessed day the day that we all behold I mean subhanAllah even today we behold it in a different way because we all watch it on TV and we, we stay in touch with it so it's the witnessed day 
And when Allah takes an oath by phenomenon in the Quran, it is always to draw our attention to this uh, phenomenon. There's something special about it. And this isn't the only place. By the dawn, by the ten days or the ten nights, referring to the ten days of the Hijjah. We spoken spoken last week, and I think we mentioned it the week before as well, that fasting, the Prophet said, the fasting of the day of Arafah expiates the sins of the previous year and the sins of the coming year. There's, there's, a, lot, uh, there's a lot of sunnah fasts, but the, the fasting of the day of Arafah is special because it's the only time where the Prophet promised us a reward of this magnitude. The day of Ashura, fasting the day of Ashura expiates the sins of the year before that. But the fasting of the day of Arafah, this doesn't apply to Hujjaj, by the way, which is one of the, the main arguments that I make when people try to, to draw a correlation between the Hujjaj and ourselves, saying that, you know, it's when the Hujjaj, like today, the Hujjaj are, are on Arafah today. So sentimentality or emotional value may think that therefore it is sunnah to fast today specifically. It's sunnah to fast in the first ten days of or first nine days of the Hijjah. But the fasting that the Prophet promised for us is technically tomorrow. Right? So if you are fasting today, mashallah, was a real murder, right? Uh, especially since uh, it's Friday today, and ideally you should pay up a Friday with another day. The Prophet ﷺ would fast for many, many years, up to the eighth year after the Hijrah. And at that point, up until that point, there was nobody on Arafah except Mushrikun. So there's no correlation between what they do and what we do as far as it needs to coincide. And the notions that float about among you know, non-scholars, I would say, uh, is is that we would like there to be no differences of opinion. We would like there to be no differences of opinion because that gives us a semblance of unity. But that's never been the case in our deen, that, that you know, we need to be united on one view and then we are united. Unity doesn't necessarily exist in conformity or uniformity. Our unity, the unity of this ummah, is, is much greater than that. We are an ummah that welcomes differences of opinion and allows these differences of opinion to facilitate ease within our lives. So as far as the whole debate here in the year out, I think the Jama'ah would know I generally don't entertain such debates and I would invite you to follow the same approach. There would be little value for me to engage in the debate unless it's you know, in, in a scholarly academic manner. And there will be even less value for you to engage in that debate. It's not going to cause any good, you know, coming from there. So if somebody says to you, and I celebrate Eid with Makkah, and you start making a big deal of it, you say, MashaAllah, by Islam and the I mean, you leave it at that, right? It's as simple as that. And if somebody says, you know, I fast when the Hujjaj on Arafah, Bismillah, go for it, right? There's no need for us to fight. We can still have a eat lunch together, right? You can invite me on, on your day and I'll come on my day also. And you can give me a slab it on both days and we all win. We all win. So, with regards to the fasting, there were many questions that were asked. Just briefly, a fatwa of this nature was distributed a couple of years ago. But uh, I just want to run through it so we can all be familiar with it. The significance of the day of Arafah is neither restricted to no contingent upon the proceedings of the Hujjaj at Arafah. In Medina, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum observed the fast of Arafah up to the eighth year after the Hijrah when no one but Mushrikun were present at Arafah. The historical records present clear evidence of the effect that in the very year that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa performed Hajj, the moon for the Hijrah was seen in Medina one day later than in Mecca. And this local sighting continued to be followed in Medina uh, for a millennium and a half. And nobody in that time period tried to align their practices with that of the Hujjaj. 
it's nice, especially when you can see them standing on Arafah and you feel you know you want to be with them in some way or the other. By all means, uh, have that. But if you are going to fast, then ideally fast uh, both days. Fast both days. Then, of course, the other issue comes in the fasting on the Friday, which is today. Now, generally speaking, one shouldn't single out a Friday for fasting. It should be fasted with the day before it, the day after it. However, when there's a special occasion, then that's, uh, that no longer applies. A special occasion has a specific reason to fast. Now, our specific reason to fast is tomorrow. So if you are fasting today, ideally you should fast tomorrow as well. What should one do here? Do we also, you know, at the Waqt of Wukuf, so for the Hujaj right now, it's like the Waqt of Wukuf. Do we also now have to stand outside and raise our hands and make dua and also gain some of the benefits of Arafah? Not quite, not exactly, but we should still try to observe the day because it's a day of fasting, it's a day of khayr. We should try to observe the day by, number one, abstaining from sin. That's the main thing, right? It's not always easy to do more, but nobody can claim that it's difficult to, you know, to do less. So stop sinning if you are, don't sin if you're not, abstain from such uh, bad influences and environments that would affect you, and then do something to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gain of the benefit, the rahmah that, that comes forth on that day. What does, what does the procedure of Arafah mean to non-hujjaj? Remember, this group of Allah's servants, this delegation, wafdullahi wa the, the pilgrims and the people who perform Umrah, they are the congregation, the dedication of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are Allah's guests, they are being honored by Him. But the entire Ummah experiences of the mercy that is sent forth there on that place, on that particular day. As we said, Hujjaj raise their hands, every one of them, and they pray for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fact that we may be included in their prayers in a general sense does not uh, does not weaken the efficacy of that prayer. It's as good as that as that Hajj or Hajjah saying, Oh Allah, forgive so and so who's sitting in Cape Town there at that moment in time. Sometimes we have this notion, right? If somebody says, Make dua for me, and we say yes, inshallah, well, and then maybe they say no. I want you to make dua for me by name. And that's fine. But remember, the one to whom you are praying knows you better than you know yourself. Right? Allah, uh, like in the dua, ritually, traditionally we say, uh, What does that mean? We are praying, we are reciting, because of them, right? For them for the deceased, for those who have passed on, or jihadihim, we hope that our recitation be rewarded in their way, you know, that it gets sent to them. Man anta a'lamu bihim, those who, oh Allah, you are more knowledgeable of them than we are. And then we say, wa bi asma'ihim, and with their names, and then we actually say their names. So Allah knows. This day reaches so far and wide that it encompasses all of mankind. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah took a covenant from the loins of Adam in uh, Na'man, that is Arafah. He brought forth from his loins. He brought forth Dhurriyatahu, his progeny. All of us, we were there. And spread them before him. All the souls stood before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he addressed them. Allah spoke to the arwah. And Allah says, Alas to be Rabbikum, am I not your Rabb? Am I not your Lord? Right? And we all responded. When I say we all, I mean every single human being and jinn that has ever existed and that will ever exist. And Allah says, Alas to be Rabbikum, and we responded, Bala shahidna. Of course you are our Lord. We pay testimony. So Allah says, So you cannot come on the day of Qiyamah saying that you didn't have a clue. And it is based on this that scholars understand the fitrah, the natural predisposition toward believing in one ultimate creator, like the, the MS DOS of every human being, pre formatting, before you learn anything, the stuff that you are born with, 
like being able to suckle from your mother, knowing how to breathe, knowing how to eat, knowing how to swallow. No one teaches us that. We are, brought, we are born pre-formatted. Part of what we are born with is an inclination to believe in Allah, to believe in a deity, the ultimate deity. This covenant is connected to Arafah. We spoke about how the first sin was atoned for at Arafah. When Abi Adam and Sayyida Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam, they met, they reunited at Jabal Rahmah, and they, they returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In what sense? This is now after they were sent into the dunya, and then they turned to Allah and says, Rabbana zalamna antusana wa illam tawfir lana wa tawhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. This covenant is for you and I to renew on this day. This is where we are at right now. We need to remember that a celebration of this nature comes with it a very, very heavy covenant. And that is the renewal of our faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, renewal of our commitment to live the way of life that Allah is pleased with and not our own ways that we can uh, imagine to be good and great, right? And it's especially important now because on a daily basis, the moral compass of humanity is shifting. Right? The idea of what is good, bad, right, wrong, good, evil is changing all the time. So the Muslim should guard himself and herself against falling into that trap. Our moral compass is set by Allah Azza wa Jal who made, who made absolutely clear that we اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا that our commitment is to Islam that Islam is the perfect way of life that Islam is the deen, the way of life that Allah has chosen for us and Allah has perfected it so we need not look elsewhere we celebrate this covenant we celebrate this covenant that we have with Allah how? by offering a sacrifice by offering a, a sacrifice and it's important to understand the nature of the sacrifice. When Allah speaks about this in the Quran, He says, The blood doesn't reach Allah. The flesh doesn't reach Allah. If one reads, you know, biblical sacrifices and the stories around biblical sacrifices, then uh, it gives the impression, it gives the impression that God wants the meat, right? Even the way that sacrifices were accepted before. Did you know in previous Anbiya, in their times, when Allah accepted a sacrifice, He would send down a bolt of fire or something of the sort to strike the sacrifice. That would be a sign that that sacrifice was accepted. So it would like, I don't know, burn up or something of the sort. This, this is from the very early days, Habil and Qabil. This is why, you know, one of the sacrifices were, were accepted, one, one was accepted and one was rejected, and then the one killed the other, right? That's how sacrifices were before. Plus it's somewhat different. Many of us, we hear the story of Nabi Ibrahim wassalam, and we somewhat wrongly assume that we were to sacrifice our own children because Nabi Ibrahim was commanded to do such. To do, to do that. But Nabi Ibrahim didn't go through with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced that. The concept there was to build within ourselves that your willingness to give up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Ibrahim was willing to give up that which he loved the most for Allah. Think about it. That which he loved the most for Allah, he was willing to give it up. Allah azza wa jal wants that from us willingness, the willingness to do so. So therefore, it is sunnah mu'akkada, at least in the Shafi'i school of thought, it is sunnah mu'akkada for anyone who can afford the sacrifice. If you have your Eid, uh, food, clothes and shelter sorted out for yourself and your family for the days and the nights of Eid and you have surplus, so you have another 2,800 rand or something of the sort. In addition to that, it becomes an emphasized sunnah for you to offer that sacrifice. It's not that Allah wants your meat. You can even eat the meat yourself, as long as you fulfill the requirements, right? Sunnah is to give away the third and the third and keep the third. But if you want, you can just give some and eat the rest. Allah doesn't want your meat. It's your willingness to say, you know what? 
I could use this 2,800 rand, I need this 2,800 rand, but I want to sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you let go of it and you offer it in the way of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wa Talal. But it comes from where? It comes from a place of taqwa. That is the embodiment of that sacrifice. The rewards are plenty, right? The sacrifice is given. The blood doesn't yet reach the ground and every sin of the person for whom the sacrifice is being offered is forgiven. The hairs, I mean, no sheep has, sheep have uh, wool. So wool technically is not made of hair, it's made of fiber. Every strand of fiber on that animal counts as a reward for the person on whose behalf that sacrifice is being offered. Right? We should all be keen. Now, I think because of the position of our school of thought that it is Sunnah Mu'akkada, we don't actually find such a tremendous culture of offering sacrifices on the days of Eid al-Adha as we do in the predominantly Hanafi communities. So in the more Hanafi communities, practically every household is offering a sacrifice, right? Because there it's considered a wajib. For us it's considered a Sunnah Mu'akkada. But don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. There's literally nothing better that you can do in these 10 days as far as a good deed is concerned than to offer that sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we will speak, inshallah, because you spoke about Ibrahim already his entire life during Ramadan. I thought I'm not going to repeat that right now. Instead, we will focus on the day of Eid, on the sacrifice itself, ta'ala. Finally, for the day of Arafah, <coughs> It is a day of forgiveness of sins. For whom? Only for the Hujjaj? It's a day of forgiveness of sins and freedom from the fire and freedom from the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Sahih of Imam Muslim, it was narrated from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no day upon which Allah frees more people from Jahannam than the day of Arafah. He comes close and he expresses his pride to the angel saying, what do these people want? Some of them are fasting. Some of them are standing on Arafah. Some of them are sitting and making dua. Some of them are getting the, the, the animal sacrifices ready. What do they want? You often find this dialogue between Allah and the Malaika as if Allah doesn't know. We know Allah knows, but it's to demonstrate to us through this dialogue so we can understand. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu narrated that the Prophet وسلم, said, Allah expresses his pride to the angels at the time of Aisha on the day of Arafah about the people on Arafah and he says, look at my servants. They've come unkempt and dusty. If you've been on Hajj, you would know by the time you get to Arafah, you lick a dirty in a physical sense. If you spent the whole previous day on Mina, right? The last time you took a formal uh, shower was like the previous day by a baram mina, so you come there dusty, disheveled, you can't scratch, you can't go brush your hair, you know, that type of thing, you're in that state. You don't have underwear on if you're a man. Think about it, just imagine yourself in that awkward position, right? And in that dusty, disheveled state, tired, broken, broken, you come to Allah and you, you cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah wants from us. Break yourself before Allah. Break yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, albeit for a moment, and you will achieve the spirit, so to speak, of uh, the rituals of, of Arafah. For us, there are a number of rituals that we need to be aware of, but we conclude with the Eid rituals that we need to be cognizant of, inshallah. Most of them we know, so this is revision and we can go through them pretty quickly. It's, a hus uh, it's sunnah to perform a, a sunnah ghusl for Eid, right? Some would say from the middle of the night, from after the middle of the night, but ideally from Fajr time on the day of Eid. Now the reason I'm mentioning after the middle of the night, Fajr is very late, Eid Salah is very early, there may not be enough time, so you can, there is a view that you can actually perform your ghusl even before Fajr. Right? Then number two, as opposed to Eid al-Fitr, where you shouldn't eat, sorry, where you should eat before you come to the Eid Salah, or Eid al-Adha, you shouldn't eat. You should abstain from eating, uh, from eating, I said eating with Ayn. You should abstain from eating. So don't eat from Fajr till you finish the Eid Salah. But the ideal way of breaking your mini poasa, your mini fast that morning, 
is that you go home after they eat salah, sacrifice your animal, take a part of the animal, the liver, make nice kermanachis or something like that in the pan, and bismillah. That's the ideal. Very few are mad enough to actually go through with that. But that's that's the, the ideal, right? This is different from Eid al-Fitr. So the Sunnah is to not eat until after you've completed the, the Eid Salah, the Eid processions. The Takbir. So we mentioned this time and, uh, and time again, but the Takbir for the day of Eid al-Adha is somewhat different to the Takbir of the day of Eid al-Fitr. There's two types of Takbir. There's Mutlaq and Restricted. That you can do anytime, anywhere, in any manner. And I like what people are doing in terms of going around to neighbors and sometimes the people sit at the back of a bucky and they sing the takbir through the area. It's nice. It's a celebration. It's not dini, so to speak. It's a celebration, right? If, it, it was, if there was ever a good bidah in our time, I think this is one of it. So that, uh, that process is takbir mutlaq. That we can do from the night before Eid uh, at about Maghrib time. But, but if you want, you can do it throughout the first 10 days of the Hijjah. And I can, right now, it's Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allah, Akbar. Do it, wherever you are. Uh, magnify the name of Allah, Azza wa Jal. But the takbir, muqayyad, the predominant view in the Shafi'i Madhab, and listen very carefully because not many people know this, the predominant view in the Shafi'i Madhab is that the takbir, Muqayyad, that which we do following the salah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. That takbir, that starts on the morning, the fajr uh, of the morning of Arafah. So for us, that's tomorrow morning at fajr time. That's tomorrow morning at fajr time. So tomorrow after you perform fajr salah, you can start making takbir. And then of course, again, after Dhuhr, after Asr, after Mar, all the way till Asr on the third day of Tashriq, the 13th of the Hijjah. So, so it starts tomorrow morning from Fajr time. That's the predominant, the Mu'tamad view in the Madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i, Rahmatullah Right, So it doesn't start the morning of the Eid, it doesn't start the night before Eid, it starts the morning, Fajr time of the ninth of the Hijjah, which for us is tomorrow morning. Um, yes, the Sunnah is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, but the whole Kaita Puchi that we do, Allahu Akbar Kabira, Alhamdulillah Kabira, that is present in the, the Shafi books of Fiqh, not coming from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam per se, but coming from the practice of our pious predecessors, and it has been included as part of the good things to recite in the Takbir, and that goes with the Salawat as well. So if you're looking for where, where's the Hadith that says it's like this, there isn't. It's part of our tradition nonetheless, right? In the Madhab of Imam Shafi'i at least, and we know we recite it here um, as a culture and as a tradition, may Allah allow it to continue. I mean, then of course, there's the offering of congratulations. You can say any words. People say all sorts of words. Um, sometimes I don't understand what people are saying, and I just shake my head. But you can say Mubarak, you can say Salamat, you can say, I don't know, what else is But the Sahaba, they used to say, Taqabbal Allahu minna wa minkum. Allah accept from us and from you, right? We've got other khutus here. I, I must get a lesson from uh, some of our elders, inshallah. Some of the, you know, it's like, Faizin, it's a quicker, couple of stuff that, I know what it means. But I, I just want to know how to put it together. It's like the whole, Kaitan got unique culture, subhanAllah. Um, so offering congratulations is good. Spending time with your family is good. But don't let your days, your day of Eid and your days of Eid be void of witnessing the Qurban, the Udhiyya. Unfortunately, some people, they, they have the whole day of Eid celebration and not one Qurban involved in the entire process. You're missing the spirit of Eid. The whole spirit of Eid is around that, right? It's like Christians celebrating Christmas without the Christmas tree. I don't know if that is, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can make that sort of comparison, but you must to witness the Qurban. And if you say, no, but it, it doesn't make me, you know, get used to it. This is part of our deen. It's part of our legacy, right? If you, if you, if you are, if you are physically unable to see it or look at it because it makes you feel queasy or whatever, that's a different story. But emotionally, that pain that we feel because of the animal, uh, being offered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's intentional. You are meant to feel that. You are meant to feel 
that, 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 that part of your fitra. Nobody taught you to feel that way, you know, when you see that. It's, it's connecting you to your natural disposition. So do embrace that, inshallah. And we should also move away from the idea of, I don't eat kurban flesh. And that's, that's not a very good thing to say, and it's not a very good practice to go about. If you don't like the meat, then buy better quality sheep. <laughs> that's actually what it comes down to. It's got nothing to do with the fact that it's kurban flesh. All flesh is kurban flesh, you think about it. Right? So what's the difference? It's the quality of sheep. Uh, that's a lecture for another time. But people want big stuff. They want duck stuff. They want, you know, the woolly All the wrong stuff. Right? And then when the small stuff comes and it's like expensive and then people say, who is the claim? And the farmers know what they are doing. Right? And uh, we, should, we should eat. We should eat of the, of the sacrificial animals. It is, it is so blessed. That meat is so blessed. Right? What grant us the understanding? Wear nice clothing on Eid. It's weird, but this Eid is, is more significant in a sense than Eid al Fitr. Eid al Fitr, we all, you know, mashallah, Eid al Adha, it's like Daga boots and uh, the old clothes because you're going to go and so on. Do that, but you know, dress up nicely. Yes, that's not the objective of Eid, it's not the primary objective at least, but it's a Sunnah. It's a Sunnah of the Prophet. One thing is make sure that what you wear is in conformity with the sunnah, right? I'm not going to go down that route, but Kanala, um, brothers and sisters, right? Have your aura, don't be too explicit, be modest, all those things, you know, victims. We don't need to have a whole lecture about the handshaking and the kissing coronas, which now, you know, so now is it real? You, just, you can still use the I got up dust trick, you shave it, so you can use that trick. But do something, just don't give in to that because the last thing you want to do on a day that you're supposed to celebrate your obedience to Allah is to celebrate the end of disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same thing applies in terms of going to the musalla via one direction and coming back via a different direction. So that's uh, the most important elements of what we need to know at this stage. Um, I would advise that if you are doing an Udhaya, a Qurban, first go read your fiqh in relation to the proper procedures about that. Right? If you had the, I think I'm probably going to do a live stream on this or something, but follow those regulations. Um, we need to treat those animals with love and care and mercy because that's the sunnah of the Prophet and part of that mercy is that when you slaughter, you slaughter according to the sunnah. Right? Don't just go experimenting because you also want to now slaughter. Right? You need to know what you are doing and if you don't, then you need to be trained by somebody who knows what they are doing. You know? This is taking the life of a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't go in the experimenting. Right? You need to know what you are doing um, and you need to do it in a merciful manner. This is what the Prophet ﷺ instructed. It may seem like an oxymoron, merciful killing, but that's exactly what it is. We don't, the notions that, uh, you know, you shouldn't eat meat and all that, that's not an Islamic notion. We should eat a little, a little meat, but we shouldn't avoid it entirely as a rule, because that's not the sunnah. So, and the sacrifices, this time of the year, more poor people who can otherwise never eat meat, they have meat throughout the world, right? So in that there is rahmah, there is mercy. May Allah Ta'ala forgive the hujjaj and for those for whom the hujjaj seek forgiveness and may forgive all of us and allow us to benefit from the ada'iyya, the du'as, the supplications of our hujjaj. Again, that announcement that I made at the beginning, our Eid procession will begin with the English nasiha that will take place at 7.30. So ideally the jama'ah should arrive from 7 o'clock already for the takbirs and so on. And if we can fill the masjid uh, well in advance, then the whole process that we do here, I think we do the, the collections and so on, that can happen sooner. We can start at 7.30 with the, with the Eid uh, Nasiha, and then the formal process starts when Imam is going to lead us in the Eid Salah. Um, and then we'll have the, the khutbah. And after the Arabic khutbah, we'll then leave. So ideally, we want to end off much earlier than we did uh, in previous years. Why, we, why are we doing this? Many masajid are doing this simply because it's a very busy day 
it's a day that we are supposed to be busying ourselves with family and the sacrifices. So in order to, to make up for about at least 30, 30 minutes to an hour in the morning, we're going to follow through with that, inshallah ta'ala. Right? So please don't arrive at like uh, 8 o'clock and, and be shocked that you know things have, have already moved on. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again forgive the hujjaj. Allah ma'afili al-hujjaj wa liman istaghfar wa lahum al-hujjaj. Allah forgive the pilgrims and for those uh, that the pilgrims seek forgiveness for. Allah forgive us and grant us blessings in this time. Allah grant our families protection and guidance on the sirat al-mustaqim. Allah bless us with beneficial halal and blessed rizq. Allah grant us expansiveness and risk that we may offer sadaqah, zakah, and sacrifice for your sake, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allah, allow those who are struggling to have a blessed Eid as well, and allow their struggle to be overcome very soon so that they can focus on that which is more important. Allah, allow us to be instrumental in the deviation of poverty and difficulty in the lives of those who face it. Allah, bring happiness, joy, and contentment to the hearts that are aching and pain. Oh Allah, bless our mothers and our fathers. Grant them all the khair and barakah. Oh Allah, for those of our, of our loved ones and friends and congregation who have passed on, grant them the highest place in Jannah, forgive them of their sins and alleviate any difficulty they may be facing in the qabr. Oh Allah, for those of us who have parents who are still alive, allow us to earn our Jannah through them. Oh Allah, for those of us who have struggles, personal struggles, whatever sorts of struggles in our own lives, Allah remove the difficulty and bring the ease. Allah remove the difficulty and bring the ease. Allah remove the difficulty and bring the ease. Allah the troubles and afflictions in our communities, in the world, in our ummah, please bring back the safety, the security, the contentment. Allah allow us to pass our tests. Allah grant us the tawfiq to pass our tests that you place before us. You will not burden us with a test that we cannot bear. Teach us to bear our burdens, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, grant us all khayr and barakah. Grant us the best in this life, the best in the world hereafter. And grant us all salvation from the fires of Jahannam. Ya Rabb, grant us through this blessed time that we find ourselves in the best 10 days of the year. That all of us gain of its blessings. Oh Allah, that this Jumu'ah that we are present in, uh, in this time way, at, at the very same time, the hujaj of, of standing on Arafah and crying to you and begging of you, oh Allah, we beg of you that you grant us each and every good supplication, dua that was ever made on the plains of Arafah by any of your servants in the past, please grant that to us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Oh Allah, of the forgiveness that you shower them with on this day, allow us to bathe in that forgiveness as well. Oh Allah, shower us with your mercy, with your blessings, with your forgiveness. Oh Allah, grant us the prophetic qualities, grant us closeness and proximity to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and remove us from the ways of shaitan. Oh Allah, remove the fitna of this world and the darknesses of this world from our lives, from our families, from our communities and bring us into the light. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة 
والحسن والحسين سيدا شباب أهل الجنة رضي الله تعالى عنهما وحمزة أسد الله وأسد رسوله رضي الله تعالى عنه وعن الصحابة أجمعين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات وألف بين قلوبنا وأصلح ذات بيننا اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين وأذل الشرك والمشركين وانصر عبادة الموحدين اللهم اغفر للحجاج ولمن استغفر لهم الحجاج اللهم اجعل لهم حجا مقبولا حجا مغرورا سعيا مشكورا ذنبا مغفورا عملا صالحا مقبولا وتجارة لن تبور يا نورا نور عالما في السدود أخرجنا يا الله وإياه من الظلمات إلى النور عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يحمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكروا الله العظيم أذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون في مصر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أعطيناك الكوفة فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الألتا الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أستغفر الله العظيم أستغفر الله العظيم أستغفر الله العظيم والتواب الرحيم الذي لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم وعبده إليه فلا شرك له ولا شرك له ولا شرك له بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه اللهم إن حجنا حجا مظلوما وسعينا سعيا مشكورا وضمنا منكورا وعملا صالحا مقبولا وتجارة لم تبور يا نور نور يا عم السلام أخرجنا يا الله من الظلمات إلى النور برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا وغفر لنا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا لا تزه قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وادخلنا الجنة مع الضرار يا عزيز يا رفاق العالمين اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك ربنا وتعالى يا الجلال والكرام سمعنا وأطعنا وأنتنا المصير ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله قبل الله يرحم Allah'a <laughs> 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 <laughs>